All right, seven o'clock. Here comes a late comer. A minute to get in here. There's Carl. He's in, is he in the waiting room too? I, I admitted him. Okay, good. All right, good to have you all. What a beautiful day we had today. At least in Parma, New York. I don't know how your day went. Uh, nice and sunny, low 70s. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a blessing to be with you all tonight to look at the Word of God. And uh, uh, this evening, what we're doing is talk about the mind of faith right the mind of faith uh the last two weeks we looked at the, the the pagan mind actually but today we'll look at the mind of faith now uh, let's go over to romans chapter number six for this all right romans chapter six we'll get started there and uh, it'll be good uh remember that this sunday um tim haley's going to be with us live in person <laughs> uh during the 10 o'clock hour okay and then I'll, I'll be doing the 11 o'clock. So uh, looking forward, we haven't heard from Tim in quite a while. So it, it should be a blessing. So chapter six, uh, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father, uh, it, it's good to be with your saints. Uh, Father, it's good to open your word. And I pray you bless us as we examine the mind of faith here this evening. Uh, it might be a blessing to all of us and help us in our daily walk our daily understanding of you and we'll thank you for that in Christ's name and amen okay let's start with verse number one all right here in Romans chapter 6 and I'm going to go down through verse number 11 what shall we say then are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase may it never be Paul says how shall we who died to sin still live in it or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away be done away with so we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is free from sin now if we have died with christ we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again death no longer is master over him for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11. Even so, consider or reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, in our text, we find that, that Paul affirms the believer's new identity. All right. His new identity in Christ we're talking about new identity what paul is doing here he's he's reflecting on our death with christ and our liberation from sin in other words so that we're no longer slaves from sin we've been liberated from that because of the work of christ so the climax of verses 1 through 10 actually is the last verse we read verse 11 even so consider yourself or reckon yourself or account yourself to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus so Paul writes all these things from verses 1 through 10 then he says but you have to reckon it in your life okay and that's very important that we understand that you have to you know depend on what Bible you read uh, reckon account see as, as we see this uh, all have the same idea so what we find is this in our union with Christ, and hopefully you realize we are in a perfect union with Christ, and we praise the Lord for that, don't we? Okay? Consider yourself, reckon yourself, or as one of the expanded translations says, 
must continually view yourself as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus. Now that's an expanded translation, boy, but it has the idea there. But let me give it to you one more time. You must continually view yourself as dead. So what the part of reckoning here is you're dead, right? And unresponsive to sin's appeal. So even though the temptation's out there, the sin is there, we're unresponsive to it, okay? While living daily for God's pleasure, not for our own, but for God's pleasure in union with our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a wonderful thought when you begin, begin to think about it, okay? And you begin to muse or, or think about that. So Paul wants his hearers to recognize their identification with Christ. Probably the most important thing that a believer can do is realize his identification with Christ because we are in union with Christ, okay? And as a result of that, and, and Paul writes this all through his epistles, and Peter picks up on it, uh, which we won't see today, but he, he does pick up with that. Because of this identification with Christ and union with Christ, then how should we live? We should live in that identity, the identity that we receive from God. And on God's part, it's a reality. On our part, what do we have to do? Verse 11, we have to reckon it or account it to be so, okay? Account it. Uh, in, in my new American standard, it says consider yourself. That's what we have to do. But it's a reality in the mind and heart of God. And I think what Paul is trying to do here is have it become a reality to us. And that's why he, he wrote it down, okay? Paul was aware that the believers do not always consistently live in this reality, all right? Live in this reality. In, act, in fact, what we would say is there's a lack of harmony. Now, you say, well, why do you say it, Brother Dan? Well, notice chapter 6 again in verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Now, why would that even come to somebody's mind that was a believer? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, uh, come back to, uh, well, I don't want to read them all, but chapter uh, 6 here. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And let me read most of it. it right along with verses 1 and 2. It's almost like verse 3 through verse 11 are parentheses here. And then it says this in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Well, why don't you do that? Because we, we've been set free from the slavery of sin, Amen. see? And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. See, this is actually what you find, folks, in, in 12 through 23 is is an explanation of what we see in verses 3 through 11, okay? Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you. Well, why not? Because we've been set free, right? We're no longer in slavery to sin. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Now, doesn't that go right along with verses 1 and 2? Yeah, it does. Okay, as you read that, verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? See how the thought continues? But thanks be to God that, <laughs> that though you were slaves of sin, now that's wonderful, you were, he says here, okay? You were slaves of sin. Uh, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. 
For having been freed from sin, you became slaves of what? Righteousness. So what, what teaching? This is a teaching of righteousness. Okay. 19. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And this is kind of uh, uh, Dan's uh, uh, messages have revolved around in Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. Give yourselves over as a living sacrifice, a slave to righteousness instead of a slave to sin. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? In other words, what was the profit in sin? There's never any profit in it, is there? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, now that's the second time this terminology has been used, enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome Eonian life or eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life or Eonian life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we use that verse quite often, verse 23, when talking to folks about their need of salvation. All right, you know, if you use the Romans road, uh, for example, you, you see that, but it goes right along with the chapter. I mean, we've been set free from sin. We're no longer a slave of sin is what Paul is talking about, okay? But the free gift of the only life is ours. So we, we praise the Lord for that. So when we look at this, now watch this. Uh, come to chapter eight with me, please. All right, chapter eight. And let's notice verses 12 and 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So Paul's picking this back up in chapter 8. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must do what? Die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Okay? But by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now we'll see this in a study in, in the future, but it all comes because of our identification and our union with the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, and we have the Spirit of God, okay? Uh, and, and we praise the Lord for that. So for us then, as believers, with this new identification uh, that we have, you know, when, when we accepted Christ and, and believed what he, he accomplished for us, okay? If you understand the new reality, to which your conversion has initiated you. Now, sometimes, you know, we don't think of it as initiation, but actually when you got saved, you were initiated into something new. You were brought into something new, a new life, right? A new relationship, a new identity with our Lord Jesus Christ. So when I read verses three and four again, it says, of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 6, 3 and 4 again. I was up in 8, right? Or do you not know? Now, Paul says that quite often, or do you not know? So remember, Paul had never been to Rome, but these dear folks had received the gospel from other folks that had heard from Paul, and, you know, Paul's converts, that, that sort of thing. So there are certain things that they should have known right along. That's why he says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into death? Now, we, we identify baptism as a passing through. Of course, in the gospel accounts and in early Acts, you know, they, they did baptize, you know, water baptize, all right? But here, we're, we're looking at a passing through. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that, that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we uh, so we too might walk in what? Newness of life, realizing that we have a new identity because of our union with Christ, and we are now free from the slavery of sin. So how are we to walk? In the newness of life. Whose life? The life of God, see? 
the life of God. So it, it, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the new identity just, just for a little bit. Now, in life, when you, when you talk to folks, you meet people, uh, you know, for the first time and, and you, you get friendly with them. How do people identify themselves? Now, now think of it, you, you know, sometimes it's by their jobs, right? It's their marital status, uh, family members, how many kids they have, uh, where they live, right? All these sort of things, it, it, as we see, the, the culture, the family models I have written down, and there's many other influences, uh, the religion they follow could be, or even if they're believers, what church do they go to? These are all ways of identifying uh, somebody. However, okay, Paul argues here, chapter six and other places, that our strongest level of identification strongest level of identification should be our identity as followers of Christ mm -hmm. or as sons of God. Okay. Son of God. And so we know then we're in a new relationship with God. You know, I have a little book downstairs. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's about the gospel. Uh, it's something like preaching the gospel to yourself, right? And in chapter one, uh, the gentleman writes, it's not a long book, 67 pages, uh, a lot of scripture in there. He says, the most important person that you can share the gospel with every day is yourself. And and I thought, you know, I've had this, this book for about 20 years. <laughs> And it really hit home when I first read it because it keeps before you your identity in Christ, right? So as you read the scriptures, how are you reading them? You're reading them as a son of God, see? And your identity then is with God, actually, because of your identity with Christ in union with him. So it's, it's a wonderful thing as, as, as you see that, all right? But also, uh, there's a new community. I don't know how many folks of you folks have friends that are believers, but there's believers all over the world. And uh, at, that's a whole community. Uh, I read recently, um, let me think of the person. I can't think of the person. It might have even been like John MacArthur. You know, I have a number of his his books. But he says one of the greatest dis. Uh, uh, oh, how do we say this? Bible translators, when they use the word church, did us a great disservice. Because actually, what does ecclesia mean or ecclesia? It doesn't mean church, all right? It means assembly. You say, well, there's a, no, because how, how are people identified today? It's by what church they go to. But actually we're in a, a, a huge assembly with God as our father, okay? And, and as, as we look at it that way, it loosens things up and it gives you more freedom to fellowship with other folks without a, being afraid of, uh, offending them because they might not believe the same way you do or, or whatever. You know what I mean? And so at, as we look at it, I think we have to look at it in terms of how would Christ think in these situations when we're among believers, right? No matter who they are. And I think that's what we have to remember, all right? Uh, you know, the church has a Facebook account, uh, Open Bible. I've never posted on it. But we have hundreds of friends right, that do post things on there. But I'll tell you what I do. If, if you don't have a, a, a Facebook, um, what happens is this. Somebody will post a question. And they'll get answers, you know, from one, to one, one question. It was 500 answers. And uh, which is fine, you know, because it's, it's a way of communicating. 
but oftentimes people get nasty all right about this and and it, it's really sad when you see that among christians so what i do is i put that person on hold for 30 days in other words i won't say <laughs> I, I i'm not being directly nasty to them i'm just saying it we don't need this on our our you know open bible fellowship uh page here we don't need this bickering uh, among christians because bickering does nothing all right uh, and bickering needs to, if you want to call it bickering or studying needs to be done face to face. All right. Or paper, write it down, send the paper out, expect the paper back. See, and, and, and that's, that's how it would, would work. So we need to do it as our Lord would do it. And, and, and that's part of our new identity. Um, six, five here says, for we have become united with him. Now, I don't know if you totally understand that uniting, but I'm going to go back to chapter 8 one more time to a verse we all know, okay? And we all love. I quote it all the time. Verse 29, For those whom he foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of whom? His son. So that he, Christ, would be the firstborn among many brethren. Conformed to his image. The identity of Christ is what we are striving to become, okay, through the work of the Spirit of God within us. This new identity, all right, to be as, as Christ is. And as a result of that, that's our new reality, okay, our new reality. So uh, a number of years ago, I did a, a message. I don't even know what it was, but part of the message had to do with uh, Jewish proselytes. You know, this is... Well, during the time of the Lord and, and prior to the, the time our Lord came to this earth. And what would happen when, it, when a Gentile person wanted to become a proselyte, right? They, they would be questioned uh, by the Jewish leaders. And what would happen, they had to be baptized. So what they did is this. Uh, they had to strip themselves of all their clothes and they put a robe on them. Then they went into the water. They took the robe off. They were baptized. Of course, they were in water already. They pour the water over their heads. Then before they get out of the pool, they put the robe back on. Now, that was a baptism of a proselyte into the Jewish uh, religion. Okay. Now, what the Jews considered from this uh, proselyte was this, that he was a brand new person. And they were always given then a Jewish name. Just like we saw the other Sunday that, you know, Paul, uh, Paul was given a, a, a Gentile name. That, that was the custom of the time. And he began to use that after he left Cyprus after meeting uh, the Roman, uh, their soldier named Paul. So he, he took that instead of Saul, his, his Jewish name. So what happened, though, with these Jewish proselytes, they were considered to be uh, so new a creature okay, or a new individual that, and I, you know, this is, the gas came out when I said this, I'm just reading it from history, and there's no record that it ever happened, but that a man could marry his mother, because he was, she was no longer his mother, and she, or he was no longer the son. They were brand new identities, is what the idea was, all right, if, if you could follow that. Now, we need to see that with our relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and our union with Jesus Christ and our identity with Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what we need to see. Uh, watch this. Come over to Romans 4. Oop, just lost my pen. Romans chapter 4. See if we can further uh, magnify this as Paul does. Let's pick this up in verse number 9. Chapter 4, verse number 9. Okay, it says this, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Now, we can go through the whole scope of Abraham's relationship with God and his, his actions, okay, towards what God told him. Beginning, hey, Abraham, get up, leave your family and 
go to a place that you don't know, don't know. Now, sometimes you figure, well, I wonder if he did that immediately or if he sat and thought about it for a while. See, uh, and, you know, it's nothing against Abraham because he acted in faith. He believed God. And so he obeyed God, you know, and then there's many other instances in Scripture where we see that in Genesis. And, and you know, then it's picked up in Romans and in Hebrews about him. OK, uh, verse 10. How then was it credited? while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Well, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Remember, there were no Jews to this point, right? And uh, many other nations practiced circumcision, by the way. But circumcision to Abraham was a sign of a covenant. You're going to read later on, right, in Genesis? Now, it says, it says in 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. In other words, righteousness isn't accredited because of some physical party or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, religious ritual, all right? And the father, verse 12, of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Okay, while uncircumcised. Let me read on. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of what? Faith. Now, many of my friends even still think, say this, that no, see, his, uh, his descendants, and they want to keep it on the fleshly realm. But as you read this, it's talking about those who weren't circumcised, right? And what's it say about them? A father, Abraham became their father. So we're definitely, definitely not talking here about the physical part of life. We're talking about the spiritual part of life, Abraham's faith. Verse 14, for if those who are the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there's no more, or there's no violation. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are the faith of Abraham, who is the father of whom? Us all. Doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. The whole thing comes to do this. The mind of faith in the person here, as an example, Abraham. Right? He lived a life with a mind of faith toward God. All right? Toward God. Now, flip over to... Uh, Chapter 5, please. Yeah. Okay. And let's pick it up in verse number 12. And notice what it says. Uh, Therefore, just as though one, uh, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where, where, or when there is no law. So no, no sin was imputed until the law was given to Moses, right? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. I mean, Adam was a type of Christ. You know, I've, I've often thought of that, and I've, I've read a number of articles about that. Not only was Adam to be what Christ was in all aspects, he was to be the king, the savior, all right, the Lord of the earth. That all men might live peaceably in a relationship with God. But of course, his own desires took over and it, it's sad. But the Bible definitely says he was to be a type of Christ. 15, but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, 
much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to whom? The many. Okay. Now, this is interesting when you read this, verse uh, 15 again, uh, where it says, for, for if the transgression of the, of the one, the many died. So why did they die even though sin wasn't being counted? Because of transgression of the one man. All right. The man who is a type of who? Christ. Okay. To be a uh, type of Christ. But then it ends, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The many is going to be defined here in a few verses. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. That's Adam's, right? But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgressions of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very important verse. We'll do what? It, it, it says here, uh, as, as you read this, uh, let's do it one more time, verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. So from Adam all the way till Moses, death reigned through whom? What's it say there? Adam. Even though sin wasn't being counted until the law was given. Okay? But then it says this, much more, much more than that, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will do what? Reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Will reign where? In life. So you and I are reigning right now if we remember and keep our identity where it needs to be. And where's that? In our union with Christ. That's our identification. We're no longer slaves to sin like those under Adam were, right? As we once were, according to Ephesians chapter 2. But our identification is with Christ now in union with him. And so what are we to be doing? Reigning in life. Reigning how? <laughs> or over who? Or whom? <laughs> you know, whichever way. Yourself. All right? Yourself. I don't get visions of grandeur, you know, I could, you know, reigning over. I remember my, my pastor, uh, where I first got saved down at Trinity, uh, he used to pray all the time that uh, when the Lord set up his kingdom, that, that he allow him to reign over Tampa Bay or Tampa, Florida, you know, uh, that's where he's from. That's where he went to school and all that kind of stuff. All right. So we'll reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So then, as uh, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even, even so, through the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to whom? All men, of life to all men. That's another great verse. One act of righteousness. What was the act of righteousness? It was Jesus Christ's cross work, say, obeying and submitting to the Father. Verse 19. All right, verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Of course, that was all, right? Uh, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many, same many, the many, will be made righteous. Now, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. That's why God gave it. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, just think about the life of, of Israel back then. When the law was given, what's the first thing God did with them? He had Moses and, uh, you know, the, the Jewish folks build a tabernacle, a tent, if you please. So the manifestation of God himself would be with them as they wandered in the wilderness, even though they were disobedient. That was his grace, his presence with them. Okay. So that, in verse 21, as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign 
through righteousness to Eonian life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when? Right now with us. That's why I love that verse, uh, you know, in Timothy, uh, he's a savior of all men, especially them that believe. Now we, I believe that all men ultimately will be saved, all right? But today, if someone gets saved, what can they enjoy? An identity with their savior, a union with him, so they can reign in life right now with him. That's the mind of faith, see? I believe that's the way I'm going. Now, let, let me keep going, okay, as, as we look at this. Uh, come to Galatians, please, in chapter number three, just three verses here. Galatians chapter three. In Galatians three, notice verse 27 through 29, please. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now, we just read that back in Romans chapter 6, right? Baptized into Christ. So here Paul tells the Galatians, you're clothed with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's uh, uh, Brother Chuck asked me a couple weeks ago. He said, Brother Dan, what's this thing about women speaking in church? The Bible says a woman should be silent in church. And I said, well, the context there of being silent is in relationship to their husbands within the church. So there's no contradiction in family feuds. I said, if a woman cannot speak in church, she can't sing. Right? Isn't singing speaking? Sure it is. Boy, everybody's quiet here tonight. Okay. And and so, uh, you know, that, that's what it was all about. But here, here it says what? In Christ Jesus, there's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor what? Female. For we're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, now remember, if you belong to Christ, you're in union with Christ, you're identified with Christ, right? As we said. Then you are Abraham's descendants, as we saw in Romans, Romans chapter 4. Heirs according to promise, see? So there, there's a lot of things to look at. And, and in Christ is the key here, all right? Uh, in Christ, there in verse number 20, uh, 28, in Christ, because in Christ then brings us to the mind of Christ, see? The mind of faith. Because his was the greatest faith that, that, that we've seen in, in the scripture. So notice how Paul describes it as we come back to Romans 6 one more time. Please. All right. Romans 6. We, we could talk all night about this. And, and this is so basic, the, these verses. But they all have to do with the mind of faith. Believing God. See? So notice what it says here in three through eight. And I'm not gonna read all of them, all the verses, but three says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his what? To his death. Who's him? That's Christ. Who are we identifying with because we're in union with? It's Christ. So we've been baptized into whose death? His death. Very important. All right, as you look at this, and you read down three through eight, and it, it, it just adds to it, okay, the idea. Uh, we're, we're, we're being freed from sin, 6-6, six, six, that we already talked about, okay, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. I mean, if you're dead, you can't sin. Just think of that, that way, okay? And we're promised a new destiny in verse number five. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his what? His resurrections. Well, hallelujah. See? I mean, these, these things are uh, exciting when, when, when you see them. But what do you have to do with it? What is your responsibility towards what we've been reading here? Remember verse 11? What's it say? Account it, consider it, reckon it. 
That's what you have to do in order to believe and continue to believe. And that's your, the mind of faith. Okay. The mind of faith. Okay. Let me turn over to page four. Okay. So your mind or your, your new identity then, as I wrote it down, your new identity then leads you to a mind of faith. Okay. The new way of thinking or reckoning. Man, I'm in union with Christ. I have his identity, see? And, and when we do that, it brings us to a new situation of life. A new way of walking, it says there in Romans chapter 6. All right? New way of walking. Believers already belong to the heavenly realm. I mean, Paul says in Ephesians 2, what? We're seated with him in heavenly places. Okay? I mean, that's, that's our position. And, and we ought not forget that. that. That's a wonderful thing. So what we look at then, let me see if I can uh, magnify this a little bit just before I close up. Come over to 1 Corinthians, please, in chapter 1. And also get chapter 5 in your hand. All right, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, in both cases. All right, so here, oh, second, oh, forgive me. 2 Corinthians 1 and 2 Corinthians 5. Here we are, Dan. All righty. All right, I'm there, hopefully you're there. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, notice verse 22. Well, let's notice 21. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed, anointed us is God. God brought us into that union and identity with Christ, who also sealed us and gave us a spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a down payment. That's pretty good. Come over to chapter 5 and notice verse number 5. It says, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. All right? Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. Have you ever thought this? When you... When you leave this earth, you'll be in his presence. Hallelujah, right? Will you need faith then? No. You'll be there with him. You won't need faith, okay? And it, it, it's a wonderful thought when, when you think like that. But until that happens, how are we to walk? In union and identity with Jesus Christ, okay? Walking in the mind of faith toward him toward him so the, the <laughs> uh i guess what we could say is this that the, the present partial experience that we have today of this new reality this union with christ just just imagine this and and i you know when, when brother denny passed on here last month it, it was very difficult for me because he was one of the few people i know that i could sit and have a cup of coffee and we could share the scriptures and and not be afraid of of uh what we thought of each other or hey, well, he's crazy he's you know and that kind of stuff and really have great fellowship uh over the word of god but and, but now dennis is right there in the presence okay of, of his lord and savior and to me it's a wonderful thought because he's he's not going to suffer any longer as he did for so many years with that arthritis you know but, but still, now he knows the total reality of being a son of God. And to me, it, it, you know, it's, it's an expectation, all right? And we've already died with Christ, haven't we? Didn't we read that? Can we believe that? We died with him? We've already been raised with him. We've already been seated with him. That's why I say it's, it's a partial reality today because we're still here. But we're here for a purpose. That purpose is magnify and and help other people see 
the very glory of our great God through through our lives, you know, as as we do this. But notice this with me in chapter five, the second Corinthians, uh, verse 16, please, where it says this. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the what? The flesh. This, this is probably one of the most difficult things that you and I will ever experience. Recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way, how? No longer. So it, it's, you know, when we see other people, how, how are we to see them? We see them black, white, red, yellow, and all that, male, female, all right, tall, thin, et cetera, et cetera, as you go down the line, you know, the whole thing about uh, your identity is in Christ. So I think what we have to realize is this, some people are, have that identity, but they don't know it yet. So our duty is to be kind to whom? Uh, Susan, that's the... Uh, subject of her uh, PowerPoints and all this for the, this coming Sunday is, is is kindness. So we see it's one of the fruit of the spirit, you know. So that that, that that's how we look at that. You know, uh, this morning I had to go down to a CVS to order a prescription, and coming out there was a, a tiny elderly, more elderly than I am, lady with a big bag. And I wanted in the worst way to say, ma'am, can I help you with that? But the last time I did that, I was sternly rebuked by a little old lady and she was gonna call the police. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. I just went and got my car and she walked off. And wouldn't you know, a lady going into the store stopped and she smiled at me and she, she asked, ma'am, can I help you with these? <laughs> you know, and, and the little lady, allowed her to do that and today you just have to be so careful but our, our kindness needs to reach out to people doesn't it yeah a, 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 as we see this and it's not because of who they are because we shouldn't recognize people anymore according to the flesh i mean it's as simple as that but we read on to 17 therefore if anyone is in christ in christ what in that union in that identity with christ what are we he is a new creature the old things pass away, behold, new things have come. Old thing, you're no longer a slave to sin, but you're a slave to righteousness, see? It's kind of exciting when you keep reading this. So the worldly evaluations of anyone are totally not legitimate, all right? We should never do that anymore. We should see people as Christ sees them. You know, and I really appreciate the, 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 the fact that in the gospel accounts, the Lord dealt with sinners, you know. And I was talking to one of the saints uh, Sunday after church, and uh, they had a little note in their Bible that said, well, this verse doesn't it wasn't really in the original manuscripts, and somebody added it, all right? And so it goes like from verse 34 to 36, it skips verse 35, but you can find it on the notes on the bottom. And, and I told I told him, I said, you know, it's the same thing in John chapter 8 with the lady uh, that they bring forth to the Lord and the guys want to take stones and stone her. That wasn't in the original manuscript, but still, what is it? It's a story of the love of God, see? And, and his love even went towards those guys that had the rocks to get them to think about themselves whoever you was without sin, throw the first stone. So what did they have to do? They had to examine themselves, all right? And actually that's a form of the grace of, of, grace of God. So a lot of things there. So what are we? we're new creations, okay? New creations. And I'll just say this as kind as I can. I believe that you and I have to share God's verdict in this. What is his verdict? You're a new creation. You're in union with Christ. Therefore, you have a new identity in Christ. And you know what that is? That's the mind of faith. You have to believe that you are what God says you are. 
the Son of God in union with our Lord Jesus Christ and identity with him. I mean, that's the ultimate according to Romans 8, 20, uh, 29, all right? So I, I hope that's a blessing. Now I'm gonna continue with this and take it a little further here uh, next week, all right? So I hope, hope it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, anybody have anything they wanna add or subtract or um, testimony about? Go ahead. Okay, number one, Yes, in our identity, and as we identify with being a child of God, a child of the King, as it were, um, we're supposed to be walking like we are. Yes. And I think that's very important. I know many of us, myself included, we don't feel like it some days. We might be, a, you know, having a poor little old me. Attitude. Yes. But that's the mindset I think that we should definitely walk, you know, walk the talk as it were. Yeah. Yep. And, then, and then number two, uh, correct me if, in, if I'm incorrect, um, in reference to Chuck's question about women speaking in the church. Oh, yeah. To stay silent. Yeah. Um, if I remember rightly, our teachings were and I just wonder if I need to be corrected on it. Our teachings were that the women were causing confusion in the church because they were asking their husbands questions uh, during the time when they weren't supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be waiting until they got home or something. Right, right. No, you're, you're, I believe you're correct on that, Gail. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. maybe we changed about that too. No, no, you're correct about that. I think his, his problem was... Uh, I'll, I'll say this. I listen to Christian radio. In fact, every Sunday on the way to church from 8.30 to 9 on uh, 10.40 a.m., uh, th there's a, uh, a service from, I think it's the Second Presbyterian Church of Avon. And it's a lady preacher. She's the pastor. And she's really good. I, I have a delightful time listening to her. Now, you know, of course, it's, it's, it was recorded the week before and they put a song before and after. So she's only teaching for like 10 or 11 minutes, you know, I haven't heard anything that I could uh, say, Oh, well, that's not right. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's really good with, with, with the practical uh, things, you know? So, I mean, when, when you hear somebody that loves the word of God and I'll say this, we, Susan and I have a, a niece down in Virginia. How old is she? There, uh, they, uh, Sharon, Sharon, she 50 some, yeah, oh, she has to be 50 I some, suppose, yeah, she be, could to be close to she has been for the last 30 years, all right, a speaker at women's meetings, and she has spoken up to 10,000 ladies at a time. Oh. And her teaching is just good. I mean, she leans a little to the Pentecostal thing, but still the basic foundations of what she's saying are wonderful, you know? And when Susan and I, you know, very, we don't get to see her very often. I think the last time was for a, was it a wedding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for a wedding down there in, in Lynchburg, Virginia. And we just had a delightful time with those folks, you know? And uh, so at any rate, I don't, I don't dis, count because some guys are so no women can't teach women can't you can't learn anything from women and uh that's too bad isn't it when, when some people have that uh that kind of attitude 15, well, it's under the law. Under 15. yeah uh oh who's talking oh carl did you say something no that was ron he's that, waiting to that talk was me to oh ron go ahead ron you your turn yeah i i read something this morning uh -huh. in my devotions yeah. Joshua 5. Okay. Um, I, 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 I can't read too well. Uh, I think it's verse 13. And it came to pass after Joshua was in Jericho that he, what's that word? Lifted up his eyes? Yeah. And, and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him. Yeah. Yeah, with the sword. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he asked him, are you, are you for us or against us? 
Yes. And, and that's a pre-incarnate representation of Christ. I think he calls him the captain of the Lord's hosts. Right. Yes. Yes. And I just wanted to check with you and make sure that that's, <laughs> that's what I believe it is. Right. <laughs> Yeah, right there in verse 15, the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for a place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a good thought there as we see that. So that's good, folks. Anybody else have anything they'd like to say or whatever? <laughs> All I know is this. It's, it's, it's good to have you folks on Wednesday nights. It's always a blessing to be able to 